Hello and welcome. Today's webinar is the impact of decentralizing homeless services on transportation mobility. <clears throat> My name is Brendan Williams. I am the research program administrator at Portland State University's Transportation Research and Education Center. Trek leads the National Institute for Transportation and Communities, a university transportation center funded by the US Department of Transportation. NITSI consortium members are the University of Utah, University of Oregon, University of Arizona, University of Texas at Arlington, and the Oregon Institute of Technology. NITSI's research priority is improving mobility of people and goods to build strong communities. Our presenters today are from the University of Utah, Dr. Sarah Canham is an associate professor in the College of Social Work and the College of Architecture. She is also the associate director of the university's health interprofessional education program. She is engaged in examining homelessness, housing security, health, and social service delivery and aging. Dr. Evis Garcia Zambrana is an assistant professor in city and metropolitan planning. Her research focuses on the relationships between urban planning, the spatial dynamics of stratification and unequal access, and community development strategies in marginalized and diverse communities. Shannon Rose is an assistant professor in the Department of Nutrition and Integrative Physiology and the project lead for the Health Sciences Driving Out Diabetes Initiative. She works with communities experiencing homelessness, service agencies, and nonprofits towards more equitable health and food systems. Dr. Jeff Rose is an assistant professor in the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism. His research focuses on issues of public space, productions of nature, connection to place, and the experiences of unsheltered homelessness. Before I turn over to our presenters, um, I have a couple of events to promote. Our next event is a Trek Friday transportation seminar on May 6th from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Pacific time. Using e-bike incentive programs to expand the market, trends and best practices, and I'll be presented by John MacArthur and Cameron Bennett from Portland State University. Our next NITSI webinar is on May 17th from 10 to 11 a.m. Pacific time, estimating the economic impacts of transportation related supply chain disruptions in the post earthquake environment by Divya Chandra, oh, Chandra Sekar from the University of Utah. I messed that up. Um, all right, so just a quick overview. This presentation will be about 40 minutes long. Then we'll have 15 minutes to answer your questions. During the presentation, please submit your questions via the Zoom Q&A. After the webinar, you'll receive an email with a link to the video recording and presentation slides. If you are tracking professional development hours, this webinar is eligible for one hour of continuing education credit. Instructions on how to redeem the credit will be included in your post webinar email. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our presenters, um, Sarah. Thank you, Brendan, for the great introduction. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. My name is Sarah Canham. I'm a faculty member at the University of Utah and, and really pleased that you all could be here today to, to hear about some of the work we've been doing in, in Salt Lake County. Um, I first want to start out our, our webinar this afternoon by acknowledging the land that we're gathered on today, where we're privileged to work and play, uh, is named for the U tribe. It's the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, the Paiute, the Goshute, and the Ute tribes. And so I wanna recognize and respect the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. Um, today, we're going to talk about a project that um, we have um, entitled the Understanding the Impact of Decentralizing 
homeless services on transportation and mobility in Salt Lake County. Uh, we will, let me, we also want to acknowledge the um, National Institute for Transportation and Communities as our funding source, <clears throat> our large number of community partners and supporters, uh, and the students who were able to participate in data collection, data analysis, and in writing portions of, of our final report. Uh, on the final slide, we'll, set a, we'll offer a link to, to where you can access the full report. So this afternoon, we will hear from the, the four of us. Um, I'll pass it over to Jeff Rose in a second here. We'll talk about the background of decentralizing homeless services in Salt Lake Valley. We will talk about the geospatial analysis that was conducted. Um, um, Evis will talk about the client surveys. Shannon will talk about the client interviews. Um, it'll come back to me for the provider and professional interviews that were conducted and a few recommendations. And then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. So I will pass it to you, Jeff. Great, thanks, Sarah. I uh, want to provide a little bit of a background for uh, the social and political situation that was going on in Salt Lake City. And in order to do so, we need to go back uh, a handful of years to understand homelessness services in the Valley. Uh, in 2019, government and civic leaders in Utah transitioned delivery of homeless sheltering services from a primarily centralized emergency shelter and operator, which is the Road Home Salt Lake Community Shelter and Resource Center, uh, which is operated by the Road Home, to a decentralized scattered site model with multiple shelter locations, providing coordinated service delivery and replacing one downtown Salt Lake City shelter for homeless resource centers or what we're calling HRCs were operated by and are operated by various service providers, including the Road Home, uh, BOA, Utah, Catholic Community Services, uh, and others were designed, built, and ultimately opened outside of the downtown area of Salt Lake City. And this transition to a decentralized model required finding sites for these new HRCs. And one of the stated considerations in the Salt Lake City Planning Commission's uh, zoning amendment was proximity to public transportation and other needed services. So <clears throat> uh, a little bit of a, of a background of the history of the road home in Salt Lake City. Uh, in 1988, under the guidance and supervision of uh, Shelter the Homeless, uh, the road home was open. Uh, previously, it was located at 210 Rio Grande Street, for those of you who might be familiar with uh, uh, Salt Lake City's downtown area. And the road home provided emergency sheltering services for up to 1,100 people on a daily basis. It was located in Salt Lake City's downtown core, which included being in a free public transportation zone and very near a variety of services and other resources that people experiencing homelessness often frequent. Uh, on November 23rd, 2015, a future facility scenario resolution was concluded uh, by, by the planning organization. And it stated that the, the concentrated service facility model in the Rio Grande area no longer meets collective needs or shared outcomes, and it should be changed. It was recommended that new facilities use a scattered site model to reduce stress on emergency services, on the emergency services system as a whole, on families and individuals who are experiencing homelessness, and on the neighborhoods that host homeless services. So uh, six years after the decentralization process was officially initiated in 2013, uh, these smaller homeless resource centers were opened in three locations separated into subpopulations of people experiencing homelessness operated by various service agencies. And so in August of 2019, uh, the, Gerald e, the Geraldine E. King Women's Resource Center uh, was opened, uh, operated by VOA Utah. Uh, and it has, well, and I'll, I'll get to the beds here in just a second. Uh, September of 2019, uh, the Gail Miller Resource Center, uh, originally operated by Catholic Community Services, currently operated by the Road Home, uh, was, uh, was operated and was for uh, self-identifying adult males and females. And then in November of 2019, uh, in South Salt Lake, uh, the Men's Resource Center was, op was open, uh, operated by the Road Home uh, for self-identifying uh, adult males. And the, the last one that we uh, are sometimes including in our analysis and, and sometimes not, was the Midvale Family Resource Center uh, for family units with, uh, with uh, minor children uh, it had been approved prior to the development of the site selection to the HRCs uh, and, and it later transitioned into this system. And so uh, on November of that year, 
uh, the three uh, resource centers opened their doors uh, finally, and subsequently the downtown road home was uh, was shuttered. And so, just to give you a little bit of a of a spatial visualization of what this might have looked like, originally we had uh, the road home Salt Lake City, uh, which you can see here on the left, with a total of about 1,100 beds, and then that was that was transitioned into this scattered site model. And so you can see there the uh, Geraldine the Geraldine King Resource Center, the Gail Miller Resource Center, the Men's Resource Center and then the Midvale Family Resource Center, uh, each of which were smaller, uh, were smaller centers. But one of the ideas behind them was that they, uh, they could operate uh, and provide some of the services that were previously uh, unavailable in the larger uh, system. So uh, built outside of the downtown core, the three new uh, homeless resource center have a combined maximum capacity of about 700 beds, which reduced the number of available shelter beds in Salt Lake County from the previous 1,100. Um, and so they were designed and built to be multi-service resource centers, uh, providing a range of services, including employment assistance, case management, healthcare, and, and other services. The HRCs uh, each provide new additional services such as uh, in-shelter food service and on-site local me medical care units. <clears throat> and so that brings us to this study. So the, this decentralization process uh, that had been ongoing uh, for a number of years in Salt Lake City provided a natural case study of how transportation demand and mobility patterns for people who are experiencing homelessness are impacted by shelter decentralization and how policymakers might anticipate and ultimately respond to possible disruptions or alterations in this population's transportation demands and mobility needs. Therefore, the areas of uh, inquiry that we proposed for this study were how does the decentralization of homeless services influence transportation demand and mobility patterns for people experiencing homelessness and how transportation and mobility changes affect uh, access to basic services for people who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, in order to do this, we, uh, we started out by convening a technical advisory committee, which was uh, consisted of representatives from local municipal governments and homeless services agencies. Um, and with them, we developed uh, multiple methodological techniques uh, that we uh, developed for this. So we started with a document analysis, of publicly available planning um, and uh, documents and reports. Uh, we did a spatial and statistical analysis of proximity to basic and essential services for clients of the new HRCs as compared to the, to the previously centralized road home. Uh, we did a survey um, of clients' travel behaviors, mobility patterns, and access to necessary services. And then we did a couple of qualitative studies. One qualitative uh, study was conducted with interviews uh, with clients who were uh, who are residing in the new HRCs and had also stayed at the previous downtown road home. And then we did a, a separate qualitative uh, study with service providers uh, and decision makers, planners, uh, folks like that who were involved in the in the transition process. Um, and so uh, what I want to do is I want to I want to present uh, briefly and, and we're going to we're going to share these these findings with y'all. I want to um, I wanna uh, start out with a little bit of the spatial analysis uh, to help us understand what was going on uh, during this decentralization process. And so the purpose of our uh, spatial analysis was to determine how the decentralization process changed transportation access and patterns, how decentralization changed overall behaviors for people experiencing homelessness uh, using the new less centralized uh, HRCs as opposed to the downtown road home. And then ultimately, uh, we wanted to propose the following uh, geospatial questions. In the process of decentralization to the four HRCs, how did accessibility to social services and basic goods change in Salt Lake County? And in the process of decentralization from the road home to the four HRCs, how did accessibility to transportation services uh, change in Salt Lake City? So uh, I wanna share a couple of uh, pieces of data with this. Uh, we conducted a network analysis using a one mile catchment area using RTIS to understand both the number and the type of services that were in reasonable proximity to the new resource centers, uh, and as well as the, the previous road home. And so uh, the table that we have here, table 2.1, shows basic services that were within a one mile, with, within one mile of the new HRCs compared with the former uh, road home. Uh, and table 2.2 at the bottom here shows that people who are experiencing homelessness had more options to transport to transportation at the single centralized resource center than they do with the decentralized model that ultimately came out of this, um, out of this later on. 
I want to provide a little bit of uh, visualization of this. And so we're, this is looking at similar data from a spatial perspective. Um, all of the HRCs are closer to the nearest bus stop than to the nearest track station. For the, this is for the, the new HRCs, the three on the right. Um, also of note here is that the irregularity of the network shapes associated, uh, particularly with the Gail Miller Resource Center and the Men's Resource Center. And what this indicates is that there is a, there's, a, there's a spatial unevenness uh, of surrounding accessibility. And this is likely due to high volume roads, private property, and otherwise uh, unwalkable spaces. And so I think overall the geospatial uh, analysis helps us understand um, uh, from, from a visual sense and from, uh, from an analytical sense that there was there were sub substantial shifts from the uh, decentralization process. And so now I'll throw it over to Evise and she can share uh, some, some of the client interview information. Well, thank you, um, Jeff. Um, so next, I'm going to be talking about the client surveys. And there's like two questions that we wanted to answer with uh, this portion. So what's the impact um, that centralization had on the frequency of people experiencing homelessness in certain transportation modes? So we were looking at uh, walking, biking, um, taking the bus, um, taking rail, um, and so on. And then the second question is like, what is the impact um, that this had on this access to services as Jeff was talking about um, the location and the proximity. So we wanted to see how that centralization changed um, that. So next slide. Um, so the survey method, so basically we recruited participants from these like three uh, homeless resource centers that were like um, brand new and uh, part of the I, of what they needed to also participate um, or um, receive services in the road home. Um, so that was like a, a qualification to be, able, to be able to participate. And basically we asked them uh, the same questions for before when they were at the um, road home and then um, after the decentralization in their new homeless resource centers. And then we will compare in those um, two uh, points in time. And the idea was to distinguish between transportation behaviors, just preferences and perceptions uh, regarding the pre and post um, decentralization. Um, so a little bit about the demographics or, or respondents. So we had like 106 uh, respondents, again, in all of these um, three homeless resource centers. Um, and the average was uh, age was like 48.8 um, years. The majority were um, male and um, they were white and also non-Hispanics, um, which um, really represents the um, Salt Lake City um, uh, homeless um, community. And then um, we had like 65% did, did have like a high school degree or less. Uh, half indicated that they were actively seeking for um, a job and 66% didn't have any kind of income like social security, disability, unemployment insurance or pensions. And uh, we also asked about um, their overall health and if they have like difficulties like walking, uh, which also uh, can be a barrier for taking transit as one. And 53.8% indicated that they had um, some kind of like trouble walking due to a physical health um, condition. Um, so then um, in this like uh, chart, there's like, um, the just like showing like the changes um, in transportation. Um, and then the, the question was like about did something change or didn't change? And then it was like by a homeless resource center. And as um, you can see, so it's uh, about a little bit less than half indicated there was like some change in the primary mode of um, transportation. And um, a lot of them already were like walking um, and taking the bus. Um, um, late, later on, we will hear from Shannon about the, the interviews. Um, I think that one of the primary changes was that people were uh, further away um, from, from rail. So that might be like a reflection of those um, changes. Um, and then we have like changes in uh, the, on all these like services um, as Jeff was like talking about. Um, so as, as you can see, 
um, this indicates like um, in the things are, are starting. So those are like in the kind of like reds and then uh, in the gray, you can see those um, things, services that kind of like continue. Um, and then in the green, you had like uh, services that um, really, or they stopped. And this is just like the percentage of, of people that indicated this first service. Um, so uh, as you can see, many of the services that um, declined uh, were like church visits and also like uh, food bank, um, also library uh, visits. Um, so this could be attributed um, to several factors. Like in the whole idea of the decentralization was to actually like put services that they will um, access. For example, there's like a, a church that gave like um, food and then like a food bank uh, next um, next to the, the row home. Um, so, it, so part of it is like now they're receiving some services on site, so which might indicate, indicate some of this um, decline. Another thing that was happening um, at the time that we did this survey is that it happened during like COVID-19. Um, so there's some things like the library, for example, that were um, actually uh, closed during the time that, that we did this. Um, however, this can also reflect that now people could um, stay and hang out in the um, homeless um, resource center as opposed to having to uh, go to some other space to um, spend their time um, like in the, in the library. But overall, we can see that the majority of the uh, services actually there was a 40% um, decline on the visits after um, decentralization. Um, so in this next one, um, I'm going to concentrate because the, it's like looking at the differences of the uh, homeless resource centers. And uh, the men uh, resource center is actually like the farthest away from downtown. It's in a different town um, altogether in South Salt Lake as opposed to Salt Lake City, um, like, like the others. Um, so so this, one, this one is like farther away. And in this one, you can see like um, big changes when we again compare with the others in terms of like accessing the food bank, um, which I already explained maybe some of the reasons why. Um, healthcare, there's, there's a clinic that people can, before used to have downtown some, some visits and now a lot of them were like doing um, telehealth, but also there's like the necessity of like still going to those places and there was a reduction um, in healthcare services and, um, um, and sadly also in like being able to see family and friends. Um, so in, in this one, respondents indicated how often they visited a particular service in a calendar year. And this was again before and after decentralization. So this um, indicates the proportion of rep responders who increase or decrease these like numbers of um, trips that they made. And um, here the important point is that the frequency of total ch shelter services visited weekly and monthly decreased by 71%. Um, percent. Um, and respondents from each uh, homeless resource center had a decrease of at least 67% in the number of trips of all services. However, something that it was like really positive is that now people were increasing um, their, the trips for job search, which it could be that, um, again, if people have like, food there they perhaps have to wait like less lines to do that they might have a little bit more of like time um and also the at least with the men homeless cent, uh, resource center in the interviews which i will turn uh, to channel just right after this people indicated that in those um, places there was actually more employment um available so now channel is going to be talking about um some of the qualitative data um, collected from um, the clients. Thanks, Evis. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the more in-depth data that we collected from folks, because of course the survey data was very important and significant, but we also wanted to dig in a little more deeply into the perspectives of the people with this lived experience of decentralization. 
So we examined the impact that this process had on transportation access and mobility from the perspective of people experiencing homelessness in Salt Lake County who used these services both pre and post decentralization. So to do this, we looked at these two following uh, research questions that we have listed on this slide. First was how has the decentralization of homeless services influenced transportation demand and mobility patterns for people experiencing homelessness? And second, how have transportation mobilities change it, uh, excuse me, changed their uh, changes affected access to basic services for people experiencing homelessness? So our methodology for this was to um, conduct in-person semi-structured interviews where we are gathering qualitative data and recording these to later be coded. And so we did this at all three of these new homeless resource centers. We had 19 total clients consent to these interviews and the age ages ranged from 20 to all the way up to 70. And all of these participants had previously stayed at the old uh, downtown road home shelter prior to decentralization. And then at the time of data collection, we're staying at one of the new uh, homeless resource centers. So I'm gonna talk just briefly about some of the findings and we organize these into pre and post decentralization benefits and challenges. So if we look at the pre-decentralization pre transportation, we found that these services were characterized as convenient to folks who were staying at the old downtown road home uh, for the proximity to the central locations, how relatively reliable transportation scheduling was, as well as the reduced cost barriers for transportation. Uh, the quote that we have here is listed from one of the clients at the Yale Miller Resource Center. And this uh, client was talking specifically about how the free fare zone that Jeff had mentioned, which was right outside of the old sh shelter, helped maintain a routine as well as a sense of normalcy and being able to access some of these services that were located by that shelter. Uh, on the next slide, uh, we're looking at some of the pre-decentralization transportation challenges. So many of these included costs uh, for places that were outside of that free fare zone, the limited services that were available within that free fare zone. So even though many of these were concentrated, there still were certainly things that were missing within that downtown core area. Uh, the challenge of walking long distance, particularly for um, specific folks, such as this client who describes some of their physical challenges and being able to walk and the impact on mobility. And then of course, the time investment that's required to use public transportation. If we look at the post decentralization transportation and mobility results. So when we were looking um, with get the perspectives of some of these folks, uh, if you can go to the next one, Sarah, thanks. So this client in particular explained the lack of flexibility in traveling from locations other than the specific stops. So one of the new and innovative approaches to transportation was the creation of a shuttle that went from resource center to resource center, but it didn't make other stops outside of these locations. So some of the clients found this to be a barrier for them to be able to access uh, some of these places due to that lack of flexibility. On the next um, portion, when we're looking at post decentralization, participants described the ability for case managers to provide transit passes or tokens at no cost to clients if needed for uh, very specific uh, services such as employment or medical appointments. Uh, this quote from one of the clients said that the demand for passes often surpassed the supply that case managers had uh, and specifically was talking about the inability to access those when they ran out of those since they had a limited number to provide, particularly for anyone not um, meeting one of those specific services or vital outcomes. Post decentralization, we also had participants describe the new HRCs, the Homeless Resource Centers, distances from the central downtown core of Salt Lake City and the subsequent increase this resulted in the time that they had to invest in utilizing public transportation and the challenges that this created. And 
as mentioned, specifically for those staying at the men's resource centers, this was located miles away from that downtown core. Many folks found that their mobility was highly impacted by the distance increase. We also found that specifically for those with mobility limitations, there were difficulties, um, particularly given the location of specific places like the Gail Miller Resource Center in terms of being able to get to some of the places that spatially might seem close, but for the folks who have physical challenges, it's still a barrier to them covering those shorter distances. And then as we see on this final slide, uh, talking about the qualitative interviews with clients, we see that the co cost of public transportation outside of that original free fare zone was very much a barrier to folks as these are all located outside of that. Some of them, particularly the Men's Source Center, uh, for whom this quote is uh, comes from a client from that location in terms of needing to now pay when previously uh, that was not a barrier to folks inside of that free fare zone. I'll pass it over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Shannon. <clears throat> Hi again, everybody. Um, so I'm going to to close us off here with the final piece of, of data that we collected for, for the study. And again, we looked at very similar questions when we talked with the providers and prof professionals, looking at how the decentralization impacted uh, clients' transportation needs and ultimately their service utilization and then some of the recommendations that individuals had for how we can improve transportation mobility and access to services for people. So <clears throat> we spoke with 24 professionals and providers uh, ranging from transportation planners, urban planners, social workers, um, individuals working in the homelessness sector, policy advisors. Um, as Evie's meant to mention, we were collecting data during um, the pandemic. So all of our, our interviews were done virtually on Zoom. Um, and we used thematic analysis to look at the data. And I'm gonna talk about two of the categories that we organized the data into. First, the, the challenges of transportation as identified by providers, and then some of the outcomes of, of mobility um, pattern changes and transportation changes following decentralization. So when we think about transportation challenges, one of the quotes we see here from a provider says, we initially didn't think transportation would impact the clients too severely because we were going to bring everything to them. But now we're facing clients that need to have their basic needs met. So we're trying to bridge the gap. So ultimately people, the, the resource centers were designed to bring um, services to individuals who were staying at the HRCs, but in many cases, um, their basic needs were still um, going unmet at the HRCs for a variety of reasons. So transportation became um, recognized as a significant issue for many people staying at the HRCs. And our report goes into much greater detail on each of these, but I'll just mention that um, people spoke about challenges related to cars, um, whether it was car ownership that individuals were trying to maintain, um, bike and mobility challenges. Um, uh, Shannon spoke to some of this, but there were challenges, even though there was the use of a shuttle, there were a lot of challenges related to availability and accessibility of the shuttle for people, um, public transit challenges, and then also specific to the Men's Resource Center, uh, people spoke about some of the challenges um, given that it's it's much further out from the downtown core. So we see another quote here, someone saying that transportation is way more important than it was before, before people could make their own way to one location pretty easily. So transportation now has become a big barrier that we didn't have previously because of this decentralization. And so I wanna move on to talk about some of the outcomes and we're going you know, fairly high level here, but but we can talk about it in the question and answer. And again, there's a lot more detail in the report as well. Um, but comparing the mobility and transportation experiences um, pre and post decentralization, we, we heard a lot about the impact on people's um, mobility um, and being able to go to places that they wanted to go, that they needed to go. Um, people spoke about how the 
sheltering system changed, but that the transit system did not change um, in, at the same time. And so we're seeing some of the impacts and outcomes of a sheltering system changing, but the transportation system not changing. Um, people now needing transit, but not having not needed it before. People now needing to make um, travel plans in advance, whereas before they could spontaneously go somewhere or they knew how to get to the library very easily or they knew how to get to their, um, previously the, um, the site of the road home was a few blocks walk to the, to the um, Fourth Street Clinic, clinic one of the main um, healthcare clinics for people experiencing homelessness in Salt Lake City. And now people needed to understand and know how to navigate the transit network um, and pay for the transit network. So this was uh, um, some of the issues that people raised, um, the needing to plan for additional travel time, um, and then the, all of this resulting as well in the increased opportunity for accidents. So the quote here says, it's been very difficult changing from a very old system to this new model. In the old model, the majority of services were within the free fare zone. Now, all of the HRCs are outside of the free fare zone and transportation is significantly more difficult. So ultimately we heard a lot about this um, resulting in reduced access to offsite services, whether it's services that were still downtown, um, healthcare services. Uh, we EB spoke about the unanticipated challenges of COVID-19. So some of the plans that were initially in place to be uh, services offered on site at the HRCs were not available to be offered on site um, because of COVID-19. So people needed to go off site in order to access some of those services. Um, and then ultimately for, for many, the, there was a re reduced motivation to leave the HRC. So here the quote reflects that, um, or maybe the next one does actually. Oh, so people's healthcare is definitely suffering because they're less likely to leave the facility um, because transportation is challenging to get down to Ford Street. So that was the quote. So I wanna conclude here uh, with some recommendations. And we have two categories that we'll cover first. Um, main um, category of recommendation is to eliminate cost barriers to transportation and some of the ways in which we can think about doing this are providing free transit for people experiencing homelessness in Salt Lake Valley, um, providing HRC clients unlimited transit that can be linked to their services card that they use to access other uh, services and supports expanding the capacity of the HRCs and providers and case managers to offer more transit passes for um, not only for employment and for um, healthcare reasons, but for other reasons as well. Um, and then another idea for eliminating some cost barriers are to base the cost of an individual's um, transit on their income. So on a sliding scale related to their income. Um, and the, the second, broad category of recommendation here is to um, increase um, the transportation access to those who are staying at the HRCs. So expanding the Utah Transit Authority's bus service, expanding the availability and accessibility of the, the shuttle service. And so um, al allowing the shuttle service to go to other locations other than just the ones that they currently go to, which are the other HRCs and um, some of the, the core services in the downtown region. Um, expanding the free fare zone out to where the HRCs are currently sited, uh, developing um, ride, share, ride share and bike share programs for people who are staying at the HRCs, and then also um, increasing transit frequency while, while reducing the cost. So essentially expanding the services available. Um, and so I'll end on the quote here um, by one of the clients um, from the Men's Resource Center who says that the free fare zone downtown, it's supposed to be for the people that live downtown and for the homeless people so that we can get around. But if they're going to move the shelters out to other places, then they need to just make it free, at least from here. So we are at our question and answer period, but I will um, leave this up for a second if anybody wants to use the QR code to get directly to the website where our report is. Um, and these slides will also be posted online afterwards. Great, thank you all so much. Um, so we have a couple of questions submitted already. Uh, feel free to get in your questions now and we'll try our best to answer them all. Um, I am wondering, uh, just based on, you know, NITSI, we're, we have, um, 
so and we're a national UTC center. So as sort of a first question, when you're studying Salt Lake City, um, what are the sort of applicability of, of your study to maybe other uh, regions? And have is there other examples that you looked at um, as far as decentralizing services? Does anybody want to take Jeff? Do you want to go to that? Sure. I think um, we we really focus on making this a case study approach, just because this was such an active um, this was such an active part of our community here in uh, in the Salt Lake Valley, and so we didn't we we intentionally sought not to make this a comparative study between other um, uh, other municipalities or other other cities in the United States. That being said, in our research, we, we came across a number of different, um, you know, proposals for different municipal services that used either the centralized versus the scattered site model. And there's a number of advantages and disadvantages to that, and not ne necessarily associated with homelessness services. It could also be um, education or healthcare or, um, or, or these other kind of uh, broad, uh, you know, provision of social services. That being said, I think uh, the, the four of us are particularly interested in, in homelessness, and there's uh, there's there's a number of, uh, of of cities and municipalities across the country that are that are facing the, the exact same uh, conundrum that Salt Lake City is, which is do you do you have this like one kind of centralized? There's there's some cities that have a campus model where there's um, you know maybe there's sheltering services. But then right there, there's there's other um, you know facilities and services available. And then what does that mean for the for the downtown area or for the the campus area where that's located? Um, and so I think I think that the tension that we saw in Salt Lake City over the past um, basically decade is probably a, a, a similar tension that other cities are, are facing and, and considering, if nothing else. If I can just add on to that, I think the other. I mean, just sort of from a broader spec, um, perspective as well, I think one of the things that the study findings highlight is the importance of transportation for people who are experienced, regardless of where it's cited, or whether it's a scatter site or a centralized model. I mean, we've previously had a centralized model and there was free transit available to individuals. And that was a core element or core mechanism by which people were able to access services or go to the library and sort of get away for the day. Um, so, so as cities um, are thinking about, um, you know, developing or redeveloping or citing new services, you know, there, we hear a lot about um, um, tiny homes for, for people experiencing homelessness. And oftentimes they're not in downtown locations, which, it, which, where, which is where majority of services are. And so if we're developing, um, you know, these new campuses, what, you know, Jeff is speaking to, we need to ensure that transportation is a key element to that conversation, regardless of it being a scattered site or a campus model. And I, I think this study really speaks to that. Great. Um, so we, we have a we have a real interest in the funding. Um, I'd like to just bring up, uh, address me one of the more unique questions. Um, th there was a mention of increased level of accidents in decentralization. I assume this is a serious, this is serious injuries and fatalities due to car crashes. Was level of comfort and feeling of safety highlighted as a factor in the need for transit access? I'm sure we can we can address that. Um, um, I think pretty clearly. Well, at, at least we can address it somewhat. Um, we didn't go in. We didn't go into safety as much as we went into accessibility and accessibility being kind of um, superordinate to safety. So if if it wasn't safe, then it wasn't accessible. So we, you know, in, both in our uh, client interviews and our client surveys, we spent a lot of time uh, asking about asking questions about accessibility. Which I think I think was highlighted in the uh, in some of the data that we presented today. I think a couple of um, a couple of events that might provide some some increased color for this is the um, the sighting of the Men's Resource Center. If East mentioned that it was that it's actually outside the boundaries of Salt Lake City, it's in South Salt Lake, which is a separate municipality, um, and uh, within uh, 
I don't want to say it exactly because I'll probably miss it, but uh, within the first couple of months of the opening, there were two fatalities associated with uh, with a fairly high traffic corridor um, right there. And so, you know, in this case, UTA, the Utah Transit is the Utah Transit Authority um, uh, immediately changed uh, some of some of the alignment of a of a nearby bus stop because folks were having to, to cross um, a fairly busy uh, commuter corridor um, in order to uh, in order to access um, basic bus services. And so, um, I, I think those kinds of high profile events really draw attention to uh, to an issue that's probably more subtle and more like felt and lived on a daily basis. The um, I mentioned the Men's Resource Center, uh, the um, the Gail Miller is also, and I mean all of these are, are located on on um, on transit areas, automobile transit areas, where we see high speeds. Uh, one of them is State Street in Salt Lake City. One of them is 300 West. For those of you who are familiar with Salt Lake City, and then the Men's Resource Center is 33rd South. And these are areas where uh, you know cars uh, travel quickly. Uh, sidewalks are not protected. Uh, you know. They're directly adjacent to uh, to the roadway. Uh, they're usually not ADA accessible in terms of um, being able to, you know, curb cuts and um, kind of basic sustainability of, uh, uh, or for you know, for mobility for, for people in wheelchairs and other needs. And so, I do think that safety was a was, a, you know, remains a primary concern, particularly for uh, for the residents and the the, the staff of these uh, of these these new HRCs. Um, and you know, previously the, the road home was in a, a, a downtown area. Um, I don't want to say the traffic was not a problem in that area, but traffic immediately surrounding the area was slower and less frequent. Yeah, I wanted to add um, that when you are like doing the uh, choosing the, the site um, for the traffic studies, like usually what they look at is like, is this going to like increase? Uh, more more traffic and in terms of like parking and um, just like things like that. Um, but the, the the traffic studies that were conducted were never about uh, the safety of the pedestrians and um, just like the the residents um, of the of the HRC. So I think that there's like a clear recommendation of also um, being thinking about the traffic studies in a more like um, people perspective, right? Not only like this this development is going to increase um, traffic, uh, which is like usually, or, or we need more parking. So I think that that's a clear thing, at least for, for planners and for decision makers that we take into consideration what needs to be done. And also um, as a second point, um, just having the a lot more collaboration with like the NGOs that are, um, that know the everyday, of like um, the the clients, um, so they actually like advocated for for these, um, and these were like some of their concerns before. But um, I don't think that there's a lot of alignment um, be between that and actually like looking um, into it. And and to the point that the the road home, like uh, which is also like they manage the men resource center, they actually created their own sidewalk, you know, like gorilla sidewalk, because they were like trying to um, do something um, about it that they noticed. Um, so it's again sad that people did have to, um, you know, die for something that it was like completely preventable through like planning and through decision making. Thanks. Those are, those are really great comments. Um, so I don't know if it's exactly fair to ask you these questions on funding, but your recommendations are about eliminating the cost barrier. So I'm I'm wondering whether that those recommendations came directly from the the um, like people that you discussed this with, or that's sort of your conclusions, and now you've going back to them about it and how sort of we have one question touching on what uh, Utah Transit Authority would do to get funding to expand their free fare zone, you know? Um, so in that sort of yeah, big general picture, yeah. Say more about like some of the things um, that the clients like we're bringing up in this like um, interviews. So as, as a client, everybody does have to register and they do have like a card that has their picture. 
and it says like which homeless resource center they are um, staying. So there was like a, a conversation that pretty much transformed itself into a focus group because they were saying like, why not treat it like, you know, the University of Utah students um, have this card that says, yeah, we're staying here. Um, and, you know, that, that might cost to students, um, I, as I recall, maybe $200 um, a year or so. And that is like subsidized like through like um, UTA. So why not do something like similar like that and add it to the services? I mean, like people already like staying in homeless um, services is like quite expensive, right? From like a case management perspective and just like all that. So it's like, you know, like that, that amount of money is not that much. So I think that it's just a matter about coordination with like UTA and the uh, service providers, because again, again, they might have like they, they, they know who's staying there, they have the, the cards and, and all that. And again, that, that's a, something that came up from, from them, from the clients. I'm wondering, so we, we do have um, a, a recent question asking from the taxpayer's point of view, um, actually how they can elevate the need for better funding for this. Um, is Presumably, a lot of this funding would be public funding, um, and it. So, I, I guess that question sort of is indicating that the the person is in favor of funding it more. But what is the general sentiment um, there, and and what is the uh, ability to, or what's going on right now to get those uh, eliminated those cash barriers? Maybe just throw out a couple of quick uh, points that uh, might might address some aspects of, of the of the funding question. In um, uh, just a couple months ago, after we wrapped up this study, um, but before this presentation, uh, UTA uh, engaged in a project called Free Fair February, and all UTA services, so bus, um, our light rail track system, and then even the, um, uh, the the commuter rail system was free for the month of February. And the, the, uh, the substantial ridership increases during that free fair February were, were pretty significant. Something, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but you know, between 20 and 30% increase of bus, between 30 and 40% of, of tracks and um, uh, the commuter rail services. And so I think one of the things that we saw there and, and the, the rationale for the free fair February was multifold. I mean, I do think there was a little bit of an equity, an, an equity focus on it. Uh, providing these services for folks who might otherwise not uh, be able to afford the services. But there was also a, a, a pretty substantial focus on, um, on you know, reducing emissions. Salt Lake Valley is characterized by uh, difficult air quality conditions, particularly in the winter months and the summer months, um, in terms of we, we get uh, our pollutants trapped in the valley with an inversion. And so one of the ideas was that there was, there was the political will to support free fair February for both equity and environmental reasons. And so um, to me, that suggests that, there's, uh, that there, is, there is the possibility of political avenues forward for supporting some of the things that I think some of these questions are getting at, like uh, expanding the free fair zone or uh, expanding um, you know, the, the things that Avis was talking about in terms of vouchers or tokens for folks who need, um, who need access and maybe are residing at one of the HRCs. And so, um, I do think that this is a this is a, a common tension between you know government supported services and who gets access to those services, and so I you know our um, our, our local situation suggests that there's there's some flexibility on the part of the state government that ultimately is one of the major funders of UTA and the, the possibility for uh, for for broader service provision, um, whether through increased free, free fares on you know geographically. Or increased provision of, uh, of tokens and other um, other ways to, to to make sure that more people are able to to get access. To there there were some suggestions as well from folks we spoke with that something as as simple as the shuttle, which is um, <clears throat> organized by Advantage Shuttle Services, paid for by um, you know through Shelter the Homeless, that 
um, the shuttle could, instead of only going to resource centers, that the shuttle could take more individuals to um, the free fare zone or to the track so, or to other locations where people could then connect more quickly into the existing transit network. Um, again, then it's, it's how do we get yeah. more shuttles for people who, um, who need them um, at the resource centers. Great. So um, we do have time if ever, anyone has a question they haven't submitted. Um, but is there anything any of you would like to um, add that maybe got cut out of the, the slides and trying to fit in this presentation or discuss maybe um, additional research you're doing on this topic in the sense of like, I know we've got you here and the real link is transportation, but it's obviously, you know, transportation is uh, a, a huge issue, but there are other um, areas to look at this from. I'll, I'll throw out a quick one just because I saw um, there was a question and maybe, maybe Sarah might've answered it in a type in a type of response, which is like, what was the, what was the real underlying issue behind uh, the decentralization process that's been going on for the last five to ten years? And I think we can, um, you know, we can look at the stated reasons and the, the kind of planning documents and things like that, which is what was in our report. I think um, to provide some some background, um, one of, one of the major uh, processes that's going on in Salt Lake City is is through the the RDA, the redevelopment. Uh, uh, agency in the area, and I think um, uh, you know there's there's a there's a major push to explicitly gentrify the downtown area, and particularly the the Rio Grande area, which is just west of, of downtown. And so this is looking like um, you know pretty substantial increases in uh, in condos and housing, uh, pretty substantial increases in restaurants, leisure, nightlife, uh, things like that, and uh, and, and major investment in capital improvements. And uh, the vision of, um, of, of, of shelters and, and unsheltered homeless folks uh, doesn't align with that vision. And so I think that this was a, this was a way to say, hey, how can, we, how can we displace this issue visually from our downtown area that we want to we see redevelop over the next um, you know, couple of decades? Um, and, and there's a number of different kind of community players that are associated with that um, and have been associated with it for uh, for multiple decades in Salt Lake City, and so I think I think that was the major push. Is what you're saying. Okay, so I guess the the other thing with the transportation, I think our focus on um, giving it free funding doesn't address um, sort of the issue that you mentioned about I don't know the richer sort of uh, things that people might be going out for that's not just located easily. Um, so family, um, in a sense. Um, does anyone wanna, I don't know, uh, say something about that, that sort of maybe that even if we make it free, we still can't provide everything type? Yeah, um, I want to add, um something not related to family and friends, but church, which is kind of related to family and friends. But I did have the opportunity to talk um, to a lot of um, just like migrant workers that again, were like staying here temporarily and a, a big place that um, they, they find community is like through the Spanish speaking um, church, which was like very closely um, located to, to the downtown um, area. So now that people are in the men's uh, resource center, basically they find it very hard to engage um, with, uh, with that community. And um, there's a lot of Latinos that are also like in the West side. So they, um, there's like shops that they had like a particular affiliation with and, and so on and people that they um, talk to. So, so I think that one go to go back and link that to the issue of um, gentrification, broadly speaking, I think that a lot of people um, have those connections with, with transportation and a lot of people that might have to like um, now like walk very, very further. Um, I talked to several people that did that from the just walk like 30 miles or something like in groups just to like go and uh, visit with uh, 
with some of their friends um, or even to find employment. So there's like, um, as I said, a lot of with the migrant um, workers, they might, there's like a bridges that they go to or like, you know, the Home Depot. So there's kind of like spaces that they frequented a lot and now they, they cannot. So yes, definitely outside of services, there's a lot of things that usually we don't think about because again, we are not immersing all these different communities and their way of life. So there's like things that are outside of the purview of planners um, and others that are making the decisions unless um, there's like a real effort to actually um, understand um, that again, there's like cultural nuances and there's a lot of things that um, are not as easy as like just like mapping them out um, with GIS. Great, thank you. All right, so we are at the end of our hour mark. Um, I want to just thank everyone who showed up today to attend. Um, we will post this uh, recording online on our YouTube and we will have the slides available as well. Um, there's the uh, final report um, and project brief in addition. Um, and yeah, I want to thank our presenters. Uh, it was a great job. <laughs> I appreciated it. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back with uh, presenting some more research in the future. Um, thank you. Thanks. Thank all. you.